passage that was just read to you at first glance sounds like a return from exile for all the nations spread out across the world uh, of Israel and even the Gentiles. <clears throat> but as we know, this, this never happened in human history uh, in a physical sense. And everything that Isaiah writes from this point on is messianic, just like Isaiah chapter 2, Joel chapter 2, and Daniel chapter 2. In Luke 1, 70 and following, uh, there is detailed how the prophets spoke of things to come, the kingdom to come. But there's something there that I want to notice. <clears throat> the coming of the church, coming of Christ. There's something that, you know, if you're not looking at it, you can miss it. It's right up in front of your face. And it is, all these nations, the whole world is bringing something back to God uh, to lay at his feet. Um, symbolically, we see silver, we see gold, we see flocks, materials. They're bringing essentially their work and their service back to God from every nation. And I want to point out today that there is a certain goodness and dignity to all work. Um, other, other nations have had uh, different accounts, myths of the creation of the world. The Greeks had Pandora's box. You know, they had this box and they said, don't open that box because there's all sorts of evil inside of it. So what did they do? They opened the box and what did they get? They got work. Uh, Babylon had the Enuma Elish and they had all these many gods and they created the world. And Marduk, the head god, he said, well, the, the world is winding down. He noticed that there, there was an upkeep to this world. He said, well, well, who's going to keep it? The gods can't do that. That's work. That's below the gods. It's demeaning. So they made man so that man could do the dirty work of the gods. And these other, these other myths, they, they demean work as something that is evil. Then we get to Genesis. Genesis, God creates man. He gets down in the dirt and he works and he builds this world. He builds a paradise. And then he makes man. And in Genesis 2, it says God took man and he placed him in the garden to keep it and to till it, to take care of it. And what did he say about that? He said it was good. Doing work is a good thing. And God made it that way. Even in a paradise where there was no sin, there was no turmoil, there was still man and there was still work. And God made it that way because of how good it actually is. Jesus comes to the earth. And he comes as a carpenter. He could have been the son of Herod. He could have been, and that's what the Jews looked for. They looked for an earthly king to come as a, as a powerful man. But Jesus came as a, as a worker, as a blue collar. He's a, he's a janitor. He's a plumber. He's the hard worker that doesn't get a lot of recognition, but he does the work. And he did it for a long time. And he worked hard. And he showed us that work and all kinds of work has dignity to it. We celebrated uh, Martin Luther King Day on Monday. <clears throat> and Martin Luther King, he was just a man. He wasn't a god. But we celebrate some of the things that he led us to in this country. And one of the things that he did on many occasions is he went to passages of the scripture to show that God provides for his creation. And how he provides for his creation through providence as he would say that the hand on the udder that gets you the milk, that's God's hand. That's God's providence. Why? Because the people, God provides for his creation through ordinary work. The nurse in the hospital, the, you know, there's a person who vacuums this church building. Uh, I won't single him out, but he does a good job. And do you think that, do you think that pleases God? Absolutely. All kinds of work, not just the people that built it, or not just the preacher, but all kinds of work has goodness and dignity. In class this morning, we looked at Philippians 4, 16 through 20, 
And Paul talks about how they gave to him, but the giving was God providing that for him. And God is going to provide it for you. If you need money, the church is going to give you money, but God is going to provide it, right? And it's this loop. And this work that you do takes care of those around you. So if you have your Christian theology screwed on straight, an understanding of the goodness and dignity of work does a few things for you. Number one, it gets rid of class snobbery. In James chapter 2, James was written to a group of people who, uh, in verse 6, 7, and 8, they were being per persecuted by rich people. They were bringing them before uh, the judgment seat, and they were being thrown in prison by rich people. Yet, they looked down on poor people because there was a class snobbery. And when you look at the goodness and dignity of all kinds of work, not just the CEO, but the man on the ground picking up the trash, all kinds of work that provides for different people, the, the hand on the soup ladle. But another thing that it does is we can see the dignity and work that we have inherited. You know, you have, you have a job that you inherited from your parents. And why do you need to do that? Well, you need to provide for your family. There's a certain, there's a certain goodness to it. Proverbs is filled with passages focused on working to provide. If God is caring for his creation with work, then how would you, there's a, a preacher up north who said, if you're a pilot and you want to glorify God with your work, how do you do that? What do you have to do? Well, you, la you land the plane. You have to do a good job in order to glorify God. <clears throat> it's this idea that when I go to my job, as many of you, I'm sure you hear probably on a daily basis, grumbling and murmuring and complaining about, oh, I gotta do this, I gotta do that, this is difficult, ugh. And, and these uggs that just come from different, different employees, different fellow workers, that attitude is not Christian. Everything that you do glorifies God. <clears throat> and it's not just white collar and blue collar work, but it's spiritual, and secular work. I think about uh, I think about Joseph. Joseph was sold into slavery. He ended up at Potiphar's house, and then he ended up in prison. And then, through his goodness and through God's providence, he ended up as a ma magistrate or a highly successful manager of a pagan, non-believing country. But he blessed the nations around him with his good work. How? Well, he did a good job. Was he door knocking? No, he wasn't door knocking. He was a manager. And he was offering food up to the nations around him. He was doing good work that blessed the nations. But number two, there's, there's something, a, sort of a different mindset. When you look at work and it becomes the focus of your life, there is, yes, there is dignity to it, but when work becomes the meaning of life, there is a division to it. it. It fragments. The Tower of Babel, the people came together, and they came together to do work and to build this great tower. But why did they, why did they want to build the tower? Why did they want to do that? It was for status. It was to say, look at this great tower that we have built. And it left God out of the plans. And what did God do? It fragmented, it divided the people, it divided the languages. Another great example in Daniel 4, 30 and 31, Nebuchadnezzar says, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? And as the word was in his mouth, a voice came from heaven saying, Your kingdom will be divided. Your kingdom will be taken from you. Why? Because what he was doing was for himself. All the work that he did was for himself. So many people today, they suffer more and more with the curse of Babel. That is to say, 
they try to seek validation or identify with this work or that work. And they say, I am a successful person, I'm a good person, and I get fulfillment because I do well at my job. And what happens when you do poorly at your job? I'm a terrible person. And that's where you see a rise in depression because the meaning of life is work. I asked, uh, I asked my dad, there was a period of time when he worked like an animal, uh, from the day he was born until about now, somewhere in there. And I asked him when we were in Georgia, I said, how do you work sun up, sun down, and you don't mind it? You seem to smile. And it's always been a phenomenon, because when I go to work, sometimes I get tired, sometimes I get cranky. I've never seen it. Never seen it out of old Jerry. Well, he said, I'm not working for myself, I'm working for the people around me. I'm working for God. When they see me, they see Christ. There was a famous musician, uh, John Coltrane, he's a jazz artist, and he measured his success in life on his music. And he said, the people are going to know me by my music. And so eventually, down the line, he got depressed. He said, I don't know why I'm depressed. I'm doing well, but there's always this this vision in the back of my mind that if I do poorly, they're going to throw me out. It's going to weigh on me, and I'm not going to be the same person. I'm not going to be great because my music is going to decline. But, he said, when I thought about why I was doing it, I discovered that there's a higher power. What I do every day, my work, it's not about me. I'm not the reason I work. It's God. Each one of us needs to understand that there is a deeper meaning apart from work, or we will work to save our souls. Even if we don't believe in God, we'll work to save our souls. But there is also a healing to work. You know, Isaiah 60 is a return from exile, but it's a spiritual exile. There was an exile in the garden. Adam and Eve were exiled due to sin. There was uh, an exile with Cain. Cain was a wanderer. But the marks of that exile is restlessness. God made a symbol of it. He said, thorns will come forth out of the ground when you're planting grain. Your work will no longer be satisfying. And you could work as much as you want, but at the end of the day, there's more to do. When work is the meaning of your life, it's exhausting. It's tiring. When the nations of Israel would be delivered from God, he will say, I will deliver you out of their hands and I will give you rest. There's a rest that is needed. There's a healing that needs to come with your work. But there are thorns everywhere we look. The more work we do, the more thorns there are. But here's where it matters. God sends his son to earth. He comes as a worker. He's a carpenter. He comes as a wanderer. He says, foxes have holes, birds have their nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And what does he get for it? He gets a crown of thorns. And on the cross, he experiences the ultimate restlessness. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And what he's, what he's doing is he's taking all the stuff that we deserve for working for ourselves. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. <clears throat> In Isaiah 59 verse 2, Isaiah writes in, that your sin has separated you from, between you and your God. There's a separation, there's a spiritual exile. What Christ has done is he has taken that exile and he has given us a return, Isaiah chapter 60. There's a church, there's a kingdom established, and it is not earthly, it's heavenly. In Ephesians 1, 21, it reads, Far above principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And hath put all things under his feet, 
and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Christ is the head over his church. He's more powerful than all those nations that come together to offer up their work and their service to God. And in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, it says, For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles. All nations flow back to the church. Remember in the passage that was read, the doors will be open for everybody. Anybody that wants to come in, there's no violence. In your gates it is salvation, it is praise. What Christ has done is he came to earth as a worker. He showed us how to work, but he took away that restlessness. He gave us a way back to where everything we do in life, what Ere you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. He gave us that, but he also gave us salvation. No more physical exile, no more spiritual exile. If that is something you are interested in, I beg you and I plead with you this morning, you have an opportunity to come back from spiritual exile. Sin has separated between you and your God, but through Christ you can come back. You can be baptized into one body, into the church, and you can become a part of that welcome home. If you have a need, please come as together we stand and as we sing. I have resolved no longer.